Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The basis for our meditation this morning is taken from our Old Testament lesson, Genesis chapter 45. May the words from my mouth and the meditation from our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Back in the day when Bubba's daughter, Bobby Sue, was in college, a fellow by the name of Jonathan Percival III asked her out on a date. They had an astronomy class together, and so Bobby Sue had a kind of a first impression opinion of him, and she thought he was kind of stuck up. But she knew that first impressions could be wrong, so she's got a good heart, and she decided to say yes and go out with Jonathan Percival III. He took her to a fancy French restaurant, insisted on ordering for her, and he ordered foie oignon for her. Now Bobby Sue, like you and me, didn't have a clue what that was. When it arrived, it turned out to be liver and onions. <laughs> so while Bobby Sue pushed the liver and onions around on her plate and never brought it to her mouth, Jonathan Percival talked. And mostly he talked about himself, how wealthy he was, how talented he was, how gifted he was, and what a good catch he would be. And you ask, did he ever talk about Bobby Sue? Well, yeah, finally he did. And he said, you know, I think you might actually be attractive if you changed your hairstyle and upgraded your wardrobe. Now, needless to say, Bobby Sue couldn't wait until this date was over. And she had determined there was no way on God's green earth that Jonathan Percival III was going to be able to kiss her goodnight. He walked her to the dorm, and at the door he said, Bobby Sue, I had a wonderful time, and I am hoping that you will let me be the son in your life. And Bobby Sue said, say what? <laughs> and Jonathan Percival said, you know, I want to be the center of your universe. I want you to see me as the source of your joy and happiness, and everything you do will be done for me. Will you be the sun in my life? And Bobby Sue said, sure. From now on, you stay 92.96 million miles away from me. And Bobby Sue hadn't really understood how practical that astronomy course was. In our Old Testament lesson, when Joseph says, when Joseph says to his brothers, Come close to me, I'm your brother. Those brothers wish they were 92 million miles from him because they were very afraid. Maybe you know the story. For those of you who don't, I'll give you the cliff notes. Joseph is the 11th of 12 sons. He's the first son of Jacob's second wife, his favorite wife, Rachel, and no doubt that Joseph is the favorite and all the brothers know it. You've probably heard the story of the fancy coat. Well, those other brothers hated his guts. And when opportunity presented itself, they threw him in a pit and they debated what to do with him. Some would say as luck would have it, I'd say as God would have it, a Midianite crew came by and they decided to sell Joseph to the Midianites. 
They took his fancy coat, dipped it in goat's blood, took it to dad and said, Dad, a wild animal must have got him. And for 20 years, Jacob grieved over his son. And Joseph, during those 20 years, had quite an adventure. He wound up in Egypt working for a guy named Potiphar, and things were going pretty well until he was thrown in jail for something that he didn't do. And then, like John was saying, Joseph had this ability, this God-given gift, to interpret dreams. He interpreted the dream of the cupbearer who had been thrown in prison, and the cupbearer was released, and Joseph said, don't forget me. And of course he did, until the Pharaoh, or the king, had a dream that none of the wise men could interpret. There were two of them, actually, but they were kind of the same, so I'll only share one. There were these seven skinny cows, and then there were these seven fat cows. And the seven skinny cows ate the seven fat cows, and they stayed skinny. <laughs> True story. Real dream. Nobody could figure it out. And Joseph said, God will tell me. And he did. It was going to be seven years of wonderful, plenteous crops, and then seven years of intense famine where nothing would grow. And the king or the pharaoh said, what do we do? And Joseph said, if I were you, I'd hire a guy who during the seven good years stored up a mess of grain so they don't starve in the seven years of famine. Pharaoh said, good idea, you're the man. And so now, 20 years after he sold to the Midianites, Joseph is second in command in all of Egypt. And the famine didn't just happen in Egypt. It happened in Canaan where the brothers and Jacob hung up. And they were running out of food. And Jacob says, I hear they got food in Egypt. Go get us some. So the boys go and they meet Joseph. He recognizes them. They don't recognize him. It's been 20 years, and now he dresses like an Egyptian. He probably looks like one, probably even walks like an Egyptian. <laughs> After a series of tests and a couple, three visits, he discovers that the boys are filled with remorse and guilt and shame. It has kind of tore him up to watch their dad grieve for 20 years. And Joseph wants reconciliation. A fancy word that means an enemy becomes a friend. And he says to them, come close to me. Is my father still alive? And the boys are scared because now they realize it really is that guy they threw in the pit and sold into slavery. But Joseph doesn't want revenge. He kind of got the sense of that gospel lesson, didn't he? Forgive your enemies. And so he tells them, just like Elsa said in Frozen, let it go, let it go, let it go. <laughs> let the remorse, the guilt, the shame, let it go. You meant it for bad, but God meant it for good. Joseph wasn't perfect. You heard it from John. He kind of had a deal with the dreams and kind of thought he was something on occasion. But overall, Joseph is a pretty impressive man. Some describe him as the most Christ-like figure in the Old Testament. Speaking of Jesus, and we always get to Jesus, don't we? And if we don't get to Jesus, we're missing the point. Jesus wants to be the Son in our lives. Not the 92 million miles away guy, 
but more like Jonathan Percival III, with one big difference. With Jonathan Percival III, it was all about him. With Jesus, it's all about you. He is crazy in love with you. And there's nothing you can do to make him stop loving you. Joseph wanted a relationship with his brothers more than they wanted a relationship with him. Sadly, sometimes it works that way with Jesus and me and maybe you. Your presence here today tells me that you want a relationship with Jesus. And I think that is wonderful. But in my case, it's not always the center of my life. Sometimes things get in the way. Sometimes I don't get around to reading his love letter. Some people call it the Bible that he gave us. And sometimes when I do, my mind is on what I'm going to do when I finish this reading instead of on what he's saying to me. Sometimes when I make a decision, after the fact, I think, you know, I really should have prayed about that first. Maybe you've got the same kind of problems, but enough with the law. Now hear the words of our text, not on Joseph's lips, but on Jesus' lips. Do not be distressed. Do not be angry with yourself. My Father sent me ahead of you to save your lives by a great deliverance. There's a lot of deliverance stories in the Bible. Our Old Testament lesson is one. Lesson is one. The Exodus is one. Some fishermen in a boat on a stormy sea and Jesus calms the storm is another. But the greatest deliverance story, not only in the scripture, but in the whole wide world, took place on a hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Some say it was called that because of its shape, some say it was called that because of what happened there. And we know the story, but I love to tell the story to those who know it best because they seem to be hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. Jesus, in love, took my sin, your sin, Joseph's sin, his brother's sin, the sin of the entire world, and he carried it to a cross and he washed it all away with his holy precious blood. So we also can let it go. Let it go. We're forgiven. God looks at us just as if we've never ever sinned. That's amazing and yet it is grace. Came across a story. It's in my Katrina file. I think I've told you about that. I lost 20 years worth of sermons and illustrations in a spiling cabinet after Katrina. The guy who did the insurance adjusting said he thought that was probably a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> and he was probably right. Anyway, one story I remember from that file is about the Eskimos. When they translated the Bible into one of the Eskimo languages, they discovered there was no word for forgiveness. So they struggled with it for a while. And then they finally said, forgiveness equals just as if it never happened. Just as if it never happened. And that's the way it is with Jesus. And <coughs> he looks at us just as if it never happened. So now what? We've been forgiven. How do we respond? The gospel has some interesting suggestions, huh? Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy. Do good to those that harm you. Jesus isn't talking about staying in an abusive situation here. Understand that. But he is talking about loving those 
that don't necessarily love us. And our old Adam wants to say, ooh, that's, that's kind of tough. It's impossible without the power of Jesus. But the spirit of the risen Christ lives in each and every one of us. Bubba had a dream. It was about Jonathan Percival III and a homeless man. Now the homeless man had spent his life helping other homeless people, giving what he could. And so they both died and they both went to heaven by grace through faith. St. Peter gave a homeless man a mansion on the beach and he gave Jonathan Percival III a tent. And Jonathan Percival III, as you can imagine, was not used to such treatment. And he said, that's no fair. How come? And Peter shrugged and said, we did the best we could with what you gave us while you were on earth. I thought that was funny. <laughs> I came across a story of a Miss Biddy Bridget Mason. She started life as a slave. Her owner took her to California, which after she was there a while, she discovered was a free state. Her owner planned on taking her to Texas, and she said, no way. I don't have to go. And the authorities backed her up. She was a free woman. And she was an industrious woman. She worked hard. And she accumulated property and wealth. And all the while she was doing that, she was helping the homeless and the struggling. She helped build hospitals. She's responsible for starting the first African, -Ameri African Methodist Episcopal Church in California. And I bring this up because she had an expression that I really like. She said, if you hold your hand closed, nothing good can come in. The open hand gives in abundance even as it receives. If you hold your hand closed, nothing good can come in. The open hand gives in abundance even as it receives. Having received much from Jesus and each other, we go out into his world and we touch others with grace, with an open hand, and we start to see his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith until life everlasting. Amen. As a result of what we have heard, what is God asking us to believe or do in the coming week, especially for the good of others?